Uh, now it's time for you to ask questions. Uh, uh, may I ask you if you mind if people ask questions in French? Is it possible? Yes, yeah, so I think I'll, I'll, I'll follow. Okay, thank you. So, I would like to ask you if you can be very straight in your question and not a long question, and I will come to give you the microphone. Uh, the first four people can ask, want to ask question. You. Um, hello. Thank you very much for uh, this uh, very inspiring uh, expose. I have uh, three very short and straightforward questions. Um, the first one: Do you think that the concept of pachamama can be applicable to seeds? Uh, because you're talking about nature, but seed mm -hmm. is a derivative of nature mm -hmm. and something produced through the action of man. Mm -hmm. So could Pachamama be applicable to seeds as well? Mm -hmm. um, the second question, um, you talked about the commons, and I, I'm, I'm a lawyer, I'm working on the commons and seeds as a commons uh, for my PhD. And you said um, commons is an anti-capitalist and anti-colonialist um, uh, concept, but not an anti-patriarchal yeah. concept. Yeah. Is that what you said? Yeah. Okay. Um, and but why? I don't really understand why. Um, and does this mean that the concept of commons does not work then to resolve the problem of seed and food that we are facing? Mm -hmm. And the last question is, what do you think of the concept of uh, global public goods? Thank you. Can you put together more questions, probably, and then an answer? You prefer two questions or three questions? Three questions, yeah. Three. Okay, I'll take the second one. <coughs> Bonsoir. Uh, je vous parle en français. Je voudrais uh, vous demander de m'expliquer un peu plus Et la relation entre la spiritualité et la, et la religion, s'il vous plaît. The third question, la troisième question, quelqu'un. So, thank you for your theory and your visions. So, I think it's very interesting. Um, but my constatation is that your theory has an echo in our university and attracts attracts people who uh, are willing to see change and to see change in society. Um, and that's people who somehow, somehow have an intellectual background. Um, my question is how to take popular social classes into the struggle for transition, and how to take people who need change, not people who are willing to see change, such as people uh, in this audience, but really people who need change into the transition, and how to make these people acquainted with notions and different concepts such as degrowth, commons, or um, the Pachamama, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, there are uh, all of them uh, very good questions. <clears throat> I'll be short because probably, well, there are more questions and I'd like to, to answer them if, if possible. The question of Pachamama and seeds, uh, of course, that's uh, the, the, the way in which the discussion on Creole or indigenous seeds is being discussed these days is more not so much on the basis of alternative cosmovisions of nature, but on the question of the autonomy of the peasant. Because if you industrialize the seed, you take away the autonomy of the peasant, because the peasant is its autonomy, his or her autonomy is based on the control of their own seeds. And uh, in India, and in, uh, we have, in India already, we have uh, an extreme reduction of varieties with the Green Revolution. But there are still, I don't know how many, hundred varieties of rice, for instance. If you are going to industrialize seeds, then we are going really to make them dependent on Monsanto, or Novartis, or Dupont, or so. So the question is not so much discussed in, in, in the ways in which it's being discussed by Via Campesina, is uh, not so much discussed in terms of Pachamama, alternative visions, but it can be articulated, can be articulating that. Because seeds are articulated more, as I see, autonomy of peasants and anti-capitalist struggle. You see, it's not so much a question of um, a different understanding of nature. Is uh, the idea that uh, without autonomy, peasants are going, not going to survive. And we have to understand that most of the food that we eat around the world is done by small uh, farmers by peasants, not by the multinational corporations, 
even though they control more and more land. So I think that uh, it is a convergent type of concept, but if I take, for instance, the concept of Pachamama to the Via Campesina, I'm going to have a conflict, which we, we in fact we have had in the past between peasants and indigenous peoples. Different understanding of seeds because of different understandings of land. For the peasant, land is land, and therefore communal land, the granular reform. For the indigenous people, land is territory, is governance, is control of administration, is a different concept, is ancestral type of land, is very much like the land in Africa, in which we have the ancestors. And therefore, there is a meaning, while the peasant has born, the struggles have, born, uh, have been born in, in Western modernity as a resistance against capitalism, the other ones are within another framework of anti-colonialism, indigenous peoples. So I think that um, you can see conflicts there, but you can see also convergences. We have, for instance, now in Brazil, for instance, conflicts between indigenous people and, and landless uh, peasants. Because the landless pe uh, peasants want land and the indigenous people say, this is our territory. So there are conflicts among different social movements that have to be dealt with. I think that the second question about commons is very intriguing to me that we have today a very strong feminist movement around the world, very diversified of course, but I, in the alternatives that are being developed, I never see that patriarchy is addressed up front. That is to say, capitalism is very much present or as an anti-capitalism or anti-colonialism, but I don't see the anti-patriarchal move there. In fact, I have to say that in many ways, they are very patriarchal. For instance, the indigenous women today in Latin America in particular, they have a, you know, this liberation movement, you know, women's liberation movement, they refuse to call themselves feminists because this is a white thing or a mestiza thing. And they don't fight for equality. They fight for a concept that in Quechua Shashawarmi means a kind of, a kind of an holistic complementarity. It's, the, it's, it's very easy for us to discredit this concept but they fight for it. And they think, and, they, and, and therefore their conceptions are different from the conceptions of the feminists, of the white, of, of, uh, of, uh, or mestiza feminism. And I give you an example uh, to show, because these are very concrete things in practice, is that when we have meetings of white feminists, and, and uh, usually they like to meet just the women, Men are really not included very often in many debates. While for indigenous m m uh, women, men have to be present. And this is seen by the white women as a kind of dependency. After all, the indigenous women are very dependent on men. The response from the indigenous women is very simple. If we don't transform the men, we never uh, reach any transformation. So we have to bring them. They have to be with us. Two conceptions of feminism. I don't see that they are absolutely contradictory, but we have to analyze the differences among them. But I'm really a bit concerned that the anti-patriarchy is the most transversal type of struggle, and sometimes it's difficult to put it up front, except that in, when it is by the women. Uh, but the important thing is that the struggles of women have to be struggles of everybody else, and vice versa. So if you go to the page of a, an initiative that I took, and now is very spread, it's, we call it Popular University of the Social Movements. You go, you know, you can go to the page www.popularuniversityofsocialmovement.org. And we have organized workshops all over the world uh, in recent times. And one most recent one was in Mozambique between women and peasants. These workshops last for two days. One third are academic people, two thirds are leaders of movements, social movements. And at the end, we have declarations, letters, you know, communique, um, press releases, and so on. And at the end, the women, the, a very important uh, feminist movement in Mozambique, came and said, from now on, 
The struggle for land is a struggle of women in Mozambique. It's not a peasant struggle. It's also our struggle. Because if my struggle is not your struggle, we are going to be defeated. And this is the most difficult thing, because different social movements have different repertoires, different languages, and are very divided among themselves. The global public good, I don't know if it's a specific theory that you are addressing of, of global public goods that come from what we call an international, uh, left international law, basically, that's what it is. But it's very much connected with the idea of the common good of humankind, of which there is already a declaration in the United Nations, as we are also struggling for declaration on the rights of the Pachamama. So there are affinities. Uh, with Wittgenstein, I would say they are family affinities or among these different uh, things. So spirituality and religion. It is very difficult. For instance, can we, uh, 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 you know, forgive me if I speak in English and not in French. No, I could probably, but uh, I stick to English now, and you can follow it, right? Well, can I really and deeply understand that a river is sacred, that a mountain is sacred? Well, I was uh, created in a culture in which sacredness is something up there. Even though for most other religions, the most sacred is down there. But in Christianity, it is up there. It is very difficult for me to be the transcendent dimension of a river beyond the materiality of the river of which I make use for my, my everyday life. If the river for me is sacred, the way I deal with it is different. I have to respect the restoration cycles of that river. I probably cannot, I can of course fish and get fish from that river, but I can destroy the fishes of, 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 of that river. I cannot pollute it. What is the idea of the seeing the transcendent within the imminent? It is difficult quite really anxiety raising, I would say, for a Western. I have been in many discussions, and that's what you become more humble, in which, in fact, uh, going back to uh, in one of my books, I, I, I deal with a great philosopher, German philosopher of the 14th century, Nicolas of Cusa, that says what we know is that we don't know, but it says that much better than Socrates. He called dox ignorantia. Learned ignorance. What we have to be is learned ignorant. That is to say, to learn that we don't know enough. That our knowledge is incomplete. So my attitude to deal with spirituality is this idea of incompleteness. So far I go, so far I can't go. But I have to respect that other people with other visions, and I have to understand that from their point of view, if you go to my project, we see a conversation I had with a very important uh, uh, anthropologist in Bolivia, Silvia Rivera Cusicanqui. We conduct our conversations at 3,900 meters. But as an evocation behind us, if you look at the video, is in my project and see that, is a two hours video, is Ilimani. Ilimani is one of the sacred mountains there in Bolivia. And she wanted that the mountain would be behind us to protect us. It's strange to me. This woman is professor at New School of New York. But she believes that the Nevada can protect us. Am I going to dismiss it and say, well, for me, it's just a mountain? I think we have to respect. So that's the concept of respect and dignity comes so close. And uh, quite frankly, I think that this spirituality allows us probably to protect the environment in a, a much better, more consistent way. Because the Nevados, in fact, if they are sacred, you can see that they are losing snow and snow, uh, ice every year because of the global warming. So there is a different understanding um, there. The fifth question is the, is the the best question ever in social science and politics. The people that need most our knowledge are the ones most incapable to have access to it. 
That's the drama of the universities and Western-centric knowledge. That's the question of legitimacy of the universities, which in fact is going to be worse and worse because universities are becoming corporate enterprises. The value of knowledge is, in, is more and more the market value of knowledge. So we are heading for a situation in which the discrepancy between uh, the good knowing and the good life are going to be more discrepant. So this work of mine, which I present here to you, and I have to write books within the academic life, of course. But when I go, I didn't do that here, but I did two weeks ago in Denmark, because I didn't know very well the Belgian scene. Wherever I go, I ask the universities that invite me. 50% of my time is with university. 50% of my time is with social movements. For instance, I spend one day at Roskilde University and one day with, trans with the trampoline house, which are house for, this, for interned people, people, asylum seekers in Denmark. And believe it or not, most of my friends of the leftist party in Copenhagen didn't know of the trampoline house didn't know of the asylum seekers problem. And they get a pass to come from very remote camps, which are concentration camps in a sense. They come to the city. They came to this event with me, to our meeting, and then they have to return the same day back to the camp. So this is Europe, but it's completely outside, even the leftist canon of uh, the group with whom I was, which is Transform Europe. So I think that your question is, there is only one way, is that we have to build, a, I think it would be a, you know, a long-term seminar yeah, with several classes on the, well, discussions on this, is what I call extension in reverse. That is to say, the ecology of knowledge, the epistemology of the South, is not too open uh, to take the university outside. I don't believe that you can take with our language, with our footnotes, with our concepts. They are not very relevant to people. What we have to do is to bring the outside world into the university. Bring the social movements to work with professors here, with the students. Make them part of the curriculum, organizations. This is very difficult, even for the people at the university to organize this, but that's what I call the reverse extension, is bring the outside world inside, inside the university. Because the university is losing legitimacy, basically because the elites of our world are trained in very few universities. My university is not one of them. I guess probably Lovallanov is probably not one of them, the global universities. The reason why the states are not investing in universities anymore is because the elites everywhere are trained in six or seven universities around the world. All of them in the United States to in England. Sorbonne will never be a global university because of the language. And that's where they are being trained. The global business schools. They have campi all over, all the including my own university in medicine because I'm affiliated with the medicine, University of Wisconsin in medicine. We have, of course, campi now in Shanghai. These are the global universities, and these are the ones that are really training the elites, very few of them. So I think that the universities have to create a different social support. And I think it has to come from the popular classes. And probably because we are going to get into a kind of a new class struggle, quite frankly, much less institutionalized because neoliberalism has destroyed trade unions in many countries. I think that here you are still strong, but in my country are very weak. In the United States, they, they are becoming almost residual. And if you go through Africa, most of the multinationals in Tanzania or in, or in Kenya, they make deals on the, on the provision that trade unions are not involved. So we see 
here that unless we create different alliances between universities and society, and I don't think there will be the elites, there will be other popular classes, and there are initiatives in some universities that are going this way, probably universities that feel uh, you know, this tension much more than we feel in Europe, I would say. But for instance, if you take some of the uh, Brazilian universities now, in the School of Medicine, we have uh, already, you know, traditional healers coming to the university and discuss with the students different alternative ways of medicine. In many countries in Africa, being certified, that's the problem, certifying traditional medicine is almost a way of making it scientific. So that's the, the paradox that may exist there. But I have no better question to that. I mean, get out of your university ghetto and try to work uh, uh, with, don't choose the struggle. We are chosen by the struggles. If you are going to decide, am I going to be an ecologist or a feminist, we will never be anything. The struggle will choose you. But you have to be open to the needs of people. I mean, you have to feel that this is a repellent way in, 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 that we live in a very protected world, but very small world. I mean, Europe is shrinking. The world is expanding and is being uglier and uglier. And I live part of my life in the United States and quite frankly, this is a, a society that is very ugly in terms of social injustice today. If the, the growth of unemployment is the one that we want in Europe, the one that we get in the United States, which is the McDonald, McDonaldization of, of labor, which is low paying labor, unspecialized, unskilled labor. I have students of mine, PhDs, that are in the McDonald's or at the counters of supermarkets because these are the jobs that are there. The most skilled jobs are not there anymore. But very few, and many of them go to China at this point. So I think that there is an antinomy here, and I have no easy answer to your question, quite frankly. Oh, yeah, you have a question, please. Go yeah, ahead. I try in English. My English is not very good. My French also, so I don't know <laughs> uh, why. I, uh, I, I'm coming from Rwanda. You know that before genocide, Rwanda was... Uh, in the French system, mm -hmm. and after, uh, it has adopted the English system. Mm -hmm. So I am between <laughs> the two systems. <laughs> now I am learning in, in French here. Okay. So you see why uh, I, am, I am not good in one and not good in another. <laughs> Try the so, French for me. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is this. According to the experience uh, of uh, uh, the change of Europe, uh, we know that in uh, 18th century, uh, philosophers contributed to change by their ideas, the mentality of uh, believing and thinking of people uh, now, in uh, our Africa, uh, my question is this, can we, how you, 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 we can uh, benefit uh, fr uh, from ideas of, uh, of scientists? Uh, so, uh, 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 excuse me. No, it's uh, fine. We know that uh, when we, do, we didn't change uh, our relation of, uh, we didn't analyze our relation of believing, we benefit, we, we think that, you, you, you gave an example, uh, people th can feed their children today, but they don't know if they feed them, they will feed them tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But I, I give you an answer. We, we say God will, will help us, will feed us. Mm -hmm. we, are, we stay in the, the, that believing. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to analyze 
a relationship with uh, God, with believing. Uh, I'm not, I'm not Dinia, but as soon as uh, we, we are taken as, as a good Christian, a good word, and so so, and so so, I remember I give you a joke. Uh, the, the president who prepared or who, who put in action genocide was said a good Christian is a good president is a good Christian. Hmm. And after we, f we felt in a genocide. You know, you see, our cities and uh, Africans, we, there is another paradox to, to, to believe. I think also our believing must be analyzed. Mm -hmm. What do we believe exactly? Yeah, w which is our relation with God? How to, to manage uh, knowledge and believing? <laughs> yes, I think it is my contribution, yeah. my bad contribution. <laughs> no, you fine. try to, well, to fine. analyze Thank good. Thank you. There is a, according to me, it is also a paradox. No, we believe uh, 90%. 100% we are Christian, but we are in crisis, in conflict. So yeah. I think as sociologists, sociologists mm -hmm. so anthropologists and the sociologists, you, you, you can contribute to, to, to help us to, to, to know, to understand that, that, mm -hmm. that paradox also. Yeah, good. Any other questions? So, uh, second question. Be, having been part of some uh, civil society forums about food systems at the FAO and UN United Nations, I've been struck by the fact that even if inviting people from um, the population, farmers, peasants, uh, fishermen, uh, the conversation was so centered around abstract concepts and English as well that it was just they were simply left out of the. It was very really hard even for uh, for activists representing them to. Mm -hmm to bring them in the conversation. And it was really, that was the first time that it struck me so much. And I was wondering if you had some words about um, the language that we should use uh, in such forums and the forms that they should take. Should they be based around uh, concrete um, struggles, such um, in really like place-based um, or, or, yeah, because yeah, instead of abstracting so many things together or theater or maybe even spirituality in the forums, yeah, really, if you have experience with that. Okay, so, is there any other to finish? Uh, but I'm sorry in advance to, uh, to play the bad role, but I'd like to, to tell you that we stopped the Yeah, okay, so I'll questions. answer the, yes. the two questions, Please. yeah, briefly. Well, the, the first question, <coughs> well, it's a very serious question, no? there is to say, <coughs> the question of the, the role that religion can play in society <clears throat> and, uh, and what are the relationship between beliefs and social transformation. Uh, here we live in a continent that was run by, throughout many centuries actually, by violence based on religion. And uh, at a given point in time, we decide to put an end to those struggles and we have the Westphalia the Treaty of Westphalia, 1648, and uh, from there developed the idea that state and church are separate. And this created different, uh, it was the, the idea that uh, freedom of religion is only possible in a world free of religion. That is to say, religion is a private sphere thing, not a public sphere thing. We know that this separation has never been complete. And in different countries in Europe, we have different traditions of that, uh, or, or in the United States. The President of the United States can say without contradiction, God bless America. But the President of France would never say this. It's because the, the, this distinction plays out differently in different countries. The question of religion in Africa is, uh, as elsewhere, I think it's, it's, it's very complex. Uh, what I think is that uh, one of the problems that we have been facing in, uh, in the World Social Forum, for instance, is that many movements are religious movements. 
or they based in religion, Christianity in different kinds of uh, Catholic, Protestant, and so on. And there are movements that, on the other side, are completely secular. For instance, a problem that we have now in France uh, about uh, the struggle against Islamophobia and racism is because ATTAC and other organizations have in their statutes that they cannot cooperate with confessional organizations. In some of the, the neighborhood associations, Islamic, for instance, they are confessional. And how can you bring together in a struggle secular movements with religious movements? So for me, the question of religion, eh, I put it in this way because that's what I'm most familiar with. Of course, that I have in the struggles, there are people that formulate their struggles in different way, and some of them formulate them in terms of struggle in the name of a progressive God. You know, uh, this book that I mentioned is about liberation theology and human rights that just came out by Stanford. That's my trying to understand that religion is playing out an ambiguous role. There are progressive theologies and reactionary theologies, both in Christianity, in Judaism, and in Islam. And we have to understand these differences between a progressive theology, and they are all political theologies in the sense of Carl Schmitt, that is to say, they claim a role for religion in public sphere. But some of them are very reactionary. They are very capitalist and colonialist and patriarchal. Others are the religions of the poor, of the dispossessed, of the struggles against racism. So that has been the liberation of theology. But there is an Islamic liberation of theology, Islamic reformation, for instance, and in Judaism also. So there are different theologies, political theologies, and we have to understand the complexity of those. So I'm not going to dismiss a movement because it is religious. My question is, which side are you on? Are on the side of the oppressors or of the oppressed? Prosperity theology, which is now is rampant in Africa, the new versions of evangelism and Pentecostal. Prosperity, as the saying that, you know, if you are prosperous financially, is because it's a blessing of God. So you, then you have to be rich. So I analyze in this book part of this prosperity theology. Well, this theology doesn't help me in the World Social Forum or in the social movements. So you have to distinguish. There are two ways of distinguish one. One is, is between the secular and the religious. The other is to distinguish among the, the religious, the reactionary theologies and the progressive theologies. If you take the world at large, the second one is the most productive type of debate. You see? So that's my take on, on, on your question. Well, the question of, of language, yeah. It's not, you know, language in broad sense is not just the English or other languages, the type of concepts that we use, the type of, uh, of, of narrative. Uh, particularly the United Nations uh, organizations. I think that is, is, a, is a dead struggle, is, a, is a not an interesting struggle. I, I think that the United Nations has been taken over by multinationals and by the United States imperialism, quite frankly. And they have not been, uh, you know, we have, we have witnessed countries that violate all the decisions, the re resolutions of uh, the Security Council and go on being the uh, the best allies of the United States, like Israel. So I don't think that we need a reform of the United Nations, quite frankly. This model, that's why I think that other types of organizations in which you, you, you we have different articulations of, of movements, they also play their role in the United Nations systems. For instance, uh, the Transcontinental Alliance of Indigenous Movements. They have been very active for the declaration of the United Nations in favor of the indigenous movements, but they have their own organizations. They use the United Nations as an instrument. We cannot afford to waste the tools. I mean, if the United Nations is there as a platform to show your struggle, you have to do it. But it's not your main struggle, not, not your main way of doing things. So many people do all kinds of, um, I would say, 
you know, uh, false type of, of, of discourses and narratives in these meetings. They have to, for instance, uh, use uh, a very conventional language of human rights when they don't believe in it. Because that's the only way of getting some funds or becoming intelligible. So I think that the movements sometimes are instrumentalizing and are instrumentalized in these institutions. So it's a double-edged type of thing. But I work more with those that, uh, you know, that meet outside uh, these forum instead of trying to put in the agenda, like the, the World March of Women, trying to put in the political agenda of different uh, uh, countries, the questions of abortion, the question of equality, the questions and so on, sexual discrimination or, or domestic violence. So these are coalitions, broad coalitions, to bring in different agendas in different nations the same type of topic. I think it is more, more productive, I think, that the, the United Nations as a playground for progressive struggles is, is gone, I think, for the time being at least. Okay, thank you very much. Good night. Thank you.